In the battle for our children's souls in today's perverse culture, Catholic parents have a key advantage. Our children were made for heaven. And a new book from author Kimberly Begg is helping Catholic parents raise strong children who are able to resist the temptations of the world, but not only resist them, face them with courage. The book is Unbreakable, Saints Who Inspired Saints to Moral Courage. Kimberly is a Catholic wife and a mother of five. She's also an attorney with over 20 years of experience strengthening Catholic and conservative causes. Kimberly, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me on, Mary. So Kimberly, you're not just a mom and an incredible attorney to boot. You're involved on in so many levels of Catholic faith and education and foundational work. It's amazing. So what was your inspiration to stop, take a break from all that and say, hey, I'm going to write this amazing book about saints and courage? Well, I wanted to write a book to help Catholics live courageously in the world. And I wrote this book specifically for parents to help them guide their children on their path to heaven. And this book is unique um, in that it tells the stories of the saints in a way that's never been done before, in a more complete way that incorporates the favorite saints of some of our church's greatest heroes, and also the stories of some of those moments during their lives where they were able to practice and develop a habit of acting courageously for Christ out in the world. And some of the saints in the book, um, I think saints are kind of like gray hairs on me. When you find one, you find more. There's always, when you find a saint, you find more saints and more holy people around that saint. They're, they don't just exist in their little bubbles. Um, so tell us, how did you connect the dots between, let's say, St. Joan of Arc in your book and the saints that inspired her? How did you find them? Well, let's see. A few years ago, I gave a presentation to a group of high school and college students about Blessed Yerji Papayushko. It was for Young America's Foundation Standing Up for Freedom Seminar. It's a wonderful program that I actually had a hand in founding um, a few years ago. And I was excited to give this presentation because of the many ways that then Father Yerji stood up for his faith. And as I was doing my research into his life, I was just so astounded and overjoyed to find out that as a boy, his favorite saint was Saint Maximilian Kolbe. And in fact, he first learned about Saint Maximilian Kolbe going to his grandmother's house and reading the Knights of the Immaculata, which was Father Kolbe's newspaper that he had published. So he loved uh, uh, Saint Maximilian Kolbe as a boy. And as he got older and he went to school, and then as a teenager, he was in this wonderful Catholic school. Um, Catholic education was uh, pretty much abolished in communist Poland at that point, but there was a school that had opened right before the communists came in and shut down all the schools. And it was run by this wonderful Catholic uh, priest who was very intentional about only hiring faithfully Catholic teachers who were trained to teach in the Catholic tradition. And so it was at this school that he discovered the writings of blessed Stefan Wyszynski, um, then, uh, then Cardinal uh, Wyszynski, who was the primate of Poland. And he just loved these sermons. So he was actually known as the philosopher uh, when he was in school because he loved the readings of uh, the readings and the writings of Saint Maximilian Kolbe. He loved the readings um, and the writings of uh, Cardinal Wyszynski, and he loved to talk about them. Um, and then he, when he ended up going to seminary, he actually went to to Cardinal Wyszynski's seminary, which was was not close. It was actually in Warsaw, which was a lot further away than the local seminary. Seminary, but then he really learned under him and trained under him in seminary. You know, fast forward a number of years in his life, and there were many opportunities for him to practice acts of courage in his life. But then in 1979, when Pope John Paul II made his historic visit to Poland, guess who was in one of the front rows um, in one of his largest audiences in Warsaw? Um, Father Jerzy. And so when you listen to uh, Blessed Jerzy Papiuszko's wonderful, wonderful homilies, these were his masses for the uh, fatherland, and he would get 20,000 people to come in person. And then they were broadcast throughout Poland and throughout the Eastern Bloc. 
um, that his followers would record his words, record them and, and, and play them over uh, Radio Free Europe and also reprint them in newspapers. But when you hear the words that he spoke in talking about the evils of communism and the dignity of the human person made in God's image, those are words that he learned through Pope John Paul II, through uh, blessed um, uh, Stefan Wyszynski and through St. Maximilian Kolbe. Um, and it made me realize this can't be unique. <laughs> you know, it, we know how important so many of the saints are to our own lives. And so I started to get curious um, about, you know, who were the favorite saints of some of our favorite saints. And um, originally the, the chapter had, the book had 12 chapters and I sort of through my research um, found about 12 of these connections, just really just out of curiosity, um, taking books that I have around the house. and. Um, started to discover them. And then just one by one, I just started writing about them. But there was so much to write um, that I ended up with uh, just 14 saints in this book and four main chapters of, of the four saints and their saintly inspirations. Wow. And I was going to say, is Father Yerzy considered a martyr or is he is is that not in his canonization process? Or yes. is he? Yes, he is. Yes. Wow. Um, I, I was going to ask you that later on here that you have St. Joan of Arc. You have another young saint from the Spanish Revolution, from the Cristeros in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And that's three out of four are martyrs and not especially old martyrs yeah. either. St. Joan of Arc in her teens, uh, the Cristero saint in his teens. I think he was 14 or something like that. 14, yep. Yeah. Was that a conscious decision on your part to pick saints that were not just courageous, but young and courageous, so young and bold? No, it wasn't. It wasn't. They were just the stories that spoke to me. And mm -hmm. as I started to write, it was almost like, you know, which, which site, which saint should I write about next? And these were the mm -hmm. saints that just came to my mind. And I just started ordering every book and reading every book that I could find about them. What's interesting about St. Joan of Arc, you know, we're all familiar with her story about having St. Michael appear to her. And we might hear about St. Margaret of Antioch and St. Catherine of Alexandria. But a lot of us modern day don't know who these saints were. They were teenage martyrs. They were teenage martyrs who gave their life standing up for Christ during the Diocletian persecutions. And so the fact that these teenagers <laughs> were visiting her and giving her inspiration so that she could stay strong so that she could leave the safety um, and the security of her home, um, which, by the way, St. Margaret was actually kicked out of her home as a teenager because her father was a pagan priest. And as soon as he discovered that she was a Christian, he kicked her out of her home. Well, she left her home for the first time at age 16. It was age 13 that St. Michael first started visiting her. But at 16 years old, she was a farm girl in France. And she left her home to go convince the captain of the, the fortress at Vaucouleurs to give her escorts to go see Charles VII, to convince him to let her lead an army um, and to, to, to chase the, the English at, um, out of France. It is, it is so impossible and it is so ridiculous that all of this happened. But it was because of the great trust that St. Joan of Arc had um, in God and in his, his, his will for her life. She had complete abandon to his will, um, just accepted 100% that this is what, not only that this is what he wanted for her life, but that this is what he wanted in the history of the world for France. And the fact that she knew going into each of the battles, including the battle where she knew she would be wounded, um, and she was wounded, she actually tried to fight through it. Um, and then she realized at some point that um, she needed medical help. And that's a great lesson for all of us, isn't it? Um, that at some point we have to look around and realize that sometimes God is actually working, you know, not just through our own um, ability to fight through something, but working through the uh, assistance of others in our life to help us at those great moments. But there was a, a, the entire last year of her life, she spent in just horrible um, conditions after her capture. So she was betrayed by her countrymen and uh, she was abandoned by her king and she had to endure just really awful um, physical and emotional 
uh, torture during that last year. And she was just interrogated, you know, on months on end, lots of trick questions. Um, but she was able to just speak truthfully about her faith in a way that honored God. And in the end, of course, it was a sham trial, which was quickly overturned, by the way, after her death. Um, but she was able to just continue to answer the questions and endure it. And of course, all they wanted was for her to apostatize and to um, it, it, to renounce her faith. But, you know, she refused. She knew not only that this was God's will for her life, um, but also that she was the only person who could accomplish this. Um, and she actually said that several times during her life, that she knew that she was the only one who was going to save France. Kimberly, contrast that kind of courage with what parents today with teens or uh, young adults, that they're told that the, the bravest thing their child could do is perhaps transition or become right. someone else or decide in this narcissistic way, hey, whoever God may is not good enough. Whoever God me, made me to be right now, that's not good enough. I need to be someone else. How does that contrast to the, the saints that you're, especially St. Joan of Arc that you're talking about in the book and the kind of courage they had to stay fast, to stand strong in their faith, even in what you're speaking about with St. Joan of Arc, such terrible treatment. Yeah, yeah, well, it's truth. You know, that's really um, the, the biggest difference here. And it's the uh, the claims of the world, right, um, on one side. And then it is the truth of, of God's law, God's law and God's love um, and the will for uh, our lives um, on the other side. So, you know, when we're talking about courage here, you know, we are talking about the courage to stand up uh, for what is good and true, you know, and, and, and what's written on our hearts as, as good and true, because we know that the truth is written in our hearts. As much as the world likes to, you know, make these outrageous claims today that, you know, boys um, can be girls um, and that, you know, sexuality is not tied to marriage. Um, sexuality is not tied to procreation and that there's nothing special um, in the sexual relationship between a husband and wife and that there's no reason to limit sexual behavior uh, between a man and a wife within a marriage. You know, a, a, as much as people say that um, and as much as our culture reinforces it through all sorts of entertainment, um, you know, through, through uh, all sorts of social media, through movies, through music and has for decades, those are the world's values. You know, those are not God's values. And Christians have always, always, always been opposed to the values of the world. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, you know. Um, and the reason the stories of the saints are so important, you know, the reason that they are the, the birthright of all Catholics is because saints inspire saints. Saints allow us to have some kind of a, a roadmap. They give us guidance. They give us real world examples. You know, Christ promised to never leave us alone. You know, he, he, he promised that he would always be with us. And yes, that the, the sacred scripture is wonderful church tradition. Um, the sacraments are really such a blessing to all of us. Um, so are the stories of the saints. Uh, and they really should be passed on down to children. I think in recent years, I think Catholics have gotten a lot better about this. Um, but in doing my research, I was fascinated to learn more about some of the saints that I had no idea about. St. Margaret and St. Uh, Catherine are two examples. But, you know, St. Jose Luis Sanchez del Rio is another example. And as is one of uh, the saints who inspired him the most, and that is St. Tarsetius, who I was completely unfamiliar with before I did uh, my research. But what's interesting is, you know, who was not unfamiliar with St. Tarsetius, not just St. Jose, but also the Catholics in his town living in the 1920s in Mexico. Because when St. Jose left his home, similarly to the way that um, Joan of Arc left her home, and joined the Cristeros cause at only 14 years old, they had uh, they had the sacraments readily available at camp because the entire purpose of the Cristero Rebellion was to fight for Mother Church in Mexico because the Mexican government um, was trying to destroy the church, had completely outlawed Catholicism. 
in Mexico. So they had the sacraments readily available. They had mass. And when the other soldiers saw this 14-year-old boy receiving the Eucharist with such reverence and kneeling and really just, you could tell that um, he understood that Christ was really present there in the Eucharist, they gave him the nickname of Tarsetius. Um, so I had to, you know, That's think, so well, who is Tarsetius? Because I didn't know. And my children didn't oh. know. They do now. My children wow. didn't know. But what I found out was Tarsetius was 12 years old during the Valerian persecutions of the third century. And uh, he volunteered to take the Eucharist to prisoners um, and Christians who could not be present for mass. And on his way, he was discovered as a Christian and he had the Eucharist in a, in a little uh, sack that he held to his chest um, and he was beaten brutally and murdered. Um, but he just, he wouldn't let go of the Eucharist. My goodness, my gosh. The stories that, you know, like we don't need Marvel. We have superheroes yes. of our own right here in our faith and we just have eyes to see them yes. and eyes to read about them. Kimberly, in the opening of your book, through your beautiful book, Unbreakable, you refer to another book from Tan, one of my favorites, Parenting for Eternity. It's by Connor Gallagher, our CEO. Why was that a, that book important in your mind to fit in? How does it fit into your greater framework of Unbreakable and what you are trying to pass on to parents? Well, um, first of all, it's it, it's a wonderful book. It's one of those books that you read um, that really just changes the way you you live your life and the way that you interact with uh, the members of your family. But Jesus Christ is the way and the truth and the life. And Connor Gallagher's book is about the way, and Unbreakable is about the way. And part of his message is that as parents, you know, you have certain duties, and uh, you have your own path. Um, to heaven that is made only for you, but your kids are a part of that. And you have responsibilities to bring them up in the faith. You know, when we baptize our children, we make promises to God. We make promises to raise our children Catholic. You know, um, and like I said earlier, it's, it's, it, that, it's not a, a box checking exercise. Um, you know, I think a lot of us uh, grew up being very poorly catechized. Um, I certainly was. Um, I, I went to mass. Um, I didn't even know what a holy day of obligation was actually until I became a young adult because I don't think anybody um, in our parish uh, went to holy days of obligation and knew what they were. I did go to mass growing up, um, but I also went to CCD um, and I took tests and um, I had, you know, teachers kind of uh, quizzing us on, you know, the Trinity. I have to tell you, my faith was a complete enigma to me. Um, mm -hmm. until I hit my 20s and started to really, really understand um, what it meant. Um, you know, the, the, the thought that uh, I was made for a particular purpose, um, that I was made to, you know, to know, to know God, to serve him, uh, to spend eternity with him in heaven, and that there would be people in my life um, who would be around me that I would be responsible for, you know, and, and helping them on their journey um, was just, it just, it, it it, it was such a fantastic revelation, you know, and that changes everything. It changes how you do everything. It changes your friendships and your work life. It changes how you spend your time, your free time, your leisure time, um, when you realize that you have these duties. So, you know, Connor's book, you know, very much it did that for me, helped me just really, you know, crystallize just all of these thoughts that I was having about my own children, about what my duties are to them. And then um, I think when I, uh, I made that wonderful discovery about uh, Blessed Jerzy Papiushko and Maximilian Kolbe, um, you know, just the idea for the book really came together. And um, it, it, I, I think there are so many more stories like this. <laughs> That's true. Those saints are an unplumbed, unplumbed depth of riches that I think sometimes we're just barely scratching. And glory to God for that. It's a wonderful thing. Again, the book is Unbreakable, Saints Who Inspired Saints to Moral Courage. You can find it here on tanbooks.com and at your local Catholic bookstore. Ask for it there. Kimberly, congrats on this beautiful project. And thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Mary. It's a pleasure.